welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to another episode of Creative Piecemeal. I am Tammy Takeishi and I'm joined today by one of my good friends and fellow sorority sisters, Jennifer Smith. Jennifer Smith is a mezzo-soprano and her unique story reminds us all of the power of believing in oneself and that it is never too late to chase your dreams. She lives in Kansas City and works in human resources for a federal agency and she has a bachelor's degree from Purdue and began her graduate work in adult and community education at Ball State. In her spare time, she enjoys singing as well as spending time with family and friends, baking, writing, and knitting. And she has even written a book. She hopes that if you take away anything from today's show, it's that nothing is more expensive than regret and that you and your dreams are worth risking. So take that leap. That is a really great uh, sentiment to start out with about taking a leap. And we'll definitely get there. We're going to backtrack a little bit, and I'd like to know who or what inspired you to become a musician and an overall creative person. I would have to say my mother. I'm an only child, and gosh, ever since, ever since, she sang to me. I have memories of music in the home all the time. She didn't play an instrument, but she sang all the time. And when you grow up, I think, surrounded by music, that just becomes a part of who you are. And my daughter now is 20, and she's a singer as well. And I had been singing to her ever since, ever since with her as well. Um, So she's become a singer, and it's just proof of the power of music um, and the connection to one another through music. So I would have to say my mom. Oh, that's nice. Do you do music currently? Like, are you in a choir or anything like that? No, I was in a choir um, at church for a little while. Music is actually something that I did... I did as a performer when I was younger, in in college, in school. Um, It's something that I stepped away from um, as I got married and entered professional life and then became a mother um, for multiple reasons. And then in the quarantine, my my coworkers and my friends tease me because they say I'm far too old to be on TikTok. But um, in the quarantine, you know, at the beginning when everyone was bored and locked in the house and um, couldn't go anywhere and couldn't really do anything, I thought, you know what, I'm going to sing on TikTok. And so I did. Um, and the more I did it, the more courageous I got and the more comments I got and the more support I got. So of course, the more support you get, the more you do it. Um, so I did that for quite some time. That's not anything that, um, I've done lately. Um, but, um, I am actually giving very serious thought to going back to school. Um, my daughter is a junior at Kansas state right now. So when she graduates, I think I'm going to take the leap and go back to school, uh, and study music, which is the thing that I wanted to do all of those years ago and didn't. Well, we wish you the best of luck in that journey and where that takes you. Thank you. So you touched a little bit on the fact that you did not study music in school, but you wanted to. What sort of made you decide to not take that leap back then? This is a really personal story, and it's not one that I have shared very often. Very few people know this story. I grew up overweight. I'm still overweight. And I think when you grow up overweight or you grow up with any kind of difference, uh, and maybe not so much today, maybe it's different today because I think the younger people today um, are more socially aware, are more emotionally intelligent than perhaps we were in the 1980s and the early 1990s. Um, But I just did not feel that I deserved that space. I did not feel that because of my weight, I belonged in that environment. And so I auditioned at Butler University. I'm, I'm from Indiana originally. Um, and Butler is just an incredible school and they have a wonderful performing arts program. And I got accepted on an early admission uh, and just fell in love with it. But it was very pricey. And unfortunately, it, and for, unfortunately, it was not affordable for our family at, at that time. And I'm sure it's still the same now. Butler gave significant aid uh, if you auditioned, but I just did not 
have the courage or the belief in myself to do it. And so I didn't. And so instead, I studied social sciences and my life took a different direction. And and while I am not sorry, many, many good things have come to me in my life because of the direction that my life has taken. There's always been a piece of me uh, that has regretted it and has felt badly about it and um, hid behind my weight. And I'm not going to do that anymore. And I don't want other people to do that. I'm 50 years old. I turned 50 in February. And I don't want anyone else to be 50 or 60 or look uh, and look back on their life and say, I wish that I had. That is a very, very powerful story. And and I'm so um, honored that you shared it on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me tell this story. It's to me... I don't want anyone else to feel the way that I felt. Nothing is more expensive than regret. We are on this earth for a very limited time. I lost my father in March and he, God love him. He fought cancer for many years, three different types of cancer. um, And he was 80 and I, God love him. I think his body, his body just wore out. He was very, very tired, but he is someone that took every chance in life. Everything that he wanted to do, he did. I I think I honor his memory by doing the same. And I honor my daughter by doing the same. I'm very, very glad that my daughter has chased her dreams uh, to be a singer and to be a performer. I'm very glad that she did many, many years ago. She's 20 now. But when she was much younger, I said to her, I said, Erin, what would you have me do differently as a mom? And that's a very loaded question to ask a young person. And I thought she would say, oh, any myriad of things. You know, you helicopter mommy too much. Give me a little bit more space perhaps. But she said, you know what, mom, I wish you would be back on stage because I know how much that meant to you. And so when your child throws down the gauntlet like that, um, you somewhat have no choice but to step forward. So it was at that time that I started getting involved in community theater, but not singing. So the singing has kind of come just more in recent years when I've made that decision to say, you know what, no more. The person that's standing in my way is me. You talked about studying music and following that pathway, where do you hope to see yourself in five years? You know, my gosh, it's hard to say. I always said to myself that even if I didn't use music, even if I went back to school and I never used it in a professional sense, it wouldn't matter because I took the chance on myself. That's all that mattered. Because then in that moment, if someone else says no, then someone else says no. But today I am the one who said no. And two in the morning is a lonely place when you are the one that stands in your own way. And I just don't want anyone else to feel that way. There is no reason for it. And music is just like any other art form, right? Some people will love what you do and some people will not love what you do. And that's fine. Art is very individualized. That's the nature of the beast. And I spent an inordinate amount of time worried about how I would be received. And that can't be anymore. It isn't about how I'm received. It's about how I feel It's about doing something that I love and hopefully inspiring other people and touching other people, hopefully. And I had a tiny little taste of that on TikTok, uh, which was wonderful. But yeah, it isn't about that. It's about me and it's my turn and it's my time. And, And anyone who's listening to this who feels that way, it's your turn as well. In fact, it was your turn. It's been your turn. I know that Um, imposter syndrome and dealing with stage fright or various issues of self-worth and self-esteem really plague a lot of people in the creative arts. And, you know, sometimes the profession, just the difficulty in the competition, because there's so many talented people, makes it hard to sort of confront that and work through that um, for many people. Do you feel that that would be a barrier for you? Or do you think that you'd be able to sort of crush that and move forward? I think that's one of the reasons that I haven't stepped forward was because I was concerned about comparison. And I think for me, it has to be a shift in thought. It isn't about comparison. There is no way that I can be compared to anyone else because I'm not anyone else. And that's the beautiful thing about about art in any form, music or sculpture, any, a painting, any any form. Even though you line up a group of painters, let's say, and they're all painting they're all doing things differently. Brushstrokes and concept and and color and creative spirit and form, it's all different. And I think music is very much the same way. You could put 10 mezzo-sopranos in a row and they're all different. And that's okay. That's one of the beauties of music and one of the beauties of art is that there's something in it for everyone as a performer and as a listener as well. 
Very true. Very true. I mean, think about how many books there are with a very similar plot, but everyone's got their own spin on it, you know? Sure. Absolutely. And the way they use language and the way they tell the story is very different. Mm -hmm. You're a very creative person in general. You know, you sing, you, you knit, you've written. Do you see yourself maybe combining a lot of those things in future projects? Oh, maybe. That's a great question. I would love to write songs. Um, I write a lot uh, for my job. I've written a book. It's not published, um, but I've written a book and I, I really enjoy writing. So I would love to write a song. And and I think that's something that's a power that music has. And I suppose other, other art forms has, have it as well. But um, a very unique gift that music has is that we get to tell a story. We get to tell a story. And if you think, you know, think about the songs that you have loved throughout your life or that have staying power, that have been popular for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, that's because of a songwriter. That's someone who can use language eloquently combined with music to tell a story, to inspire you or make you feel or remind you of a time in your life. And I just think that's really powerful. So if I could do that someday, if someone would walk up to me and say, your song was at my wedding or your song was with me when I went through a hardship, that would make me feel amazing because I, I have those, un, those entertainers that I would say that to, you know, your song was with me during a difficult point in my life. And now I smile as I cry when I hear it, you know, so I think what a gift to be able to give uh, to the public, to be able to write a song that inspires or makes them feel. Knowing you personally, I think that you'd be really great at that. Thank you very much. That makes me feel good. Thank you very much. You talked about songwriters that really inspire you. What are, if you don't mind sharing, who are some of those people? The first one that comes to mind is Melissa Etheridge. Um, she is the every person. She, you know, she writes stories that speak to the heart, um, that speak to the human experience. And that's something that we all feel. We all feel love. We all feel loss. We all feel injury. Um, Many people feel discrimination, as she has um, for being a member of the LGBTQ community. She is one of the first ones that comes to my mind, and it's actually one of her songs um, that I was referencing before, that I cry when I hear it, but I smile. And I just have this dream of one day walking up to her and saying, hi, I'm from Kansas too, hi, because um, she's from Leavenworth here in Kansas, um, and just thanking her for her music. So she's one of them. And there are so many incredible songwriters and what a gift to have to be able to tell a story through music. What an incredible gift. The creative process is always a little bit murky at times. So what are some of your favorite and least favorite parts about that? There's something about the way it feels and there's there's no way that it can be described. It's something that you have to go through about standing on a stage and looking out into a crowd of people and looking at the lights and just being in that moment. And, and it's indescribable. It's just something that you have to go through. Um, that feels incredible. Applause feels incredible. Having someone approach you and say, that was impactful to me. That made me feel good. That made me laugh. That made me happy. Um, that's incredible. Um, I think a significant downside, and, and I know many people feel it at differing degrees, is just the self-doubt. Can I do this? You know, am I worthy to be in this space? Can I do this? Can I do this justice? Um, and then being, being you know, gracious with yourself because none of us are perfect. We will all make mistakes and that's okay. And making a mistake or, or falling does not mean you stay down. It means you honor it, you learn from your mistake, and you move forward. And, and really, I think for me anyway, the growth point is it, that doesn't matter if someone can tell the story better. Better is not a word that exists in this space. They don't tell it better. They tell it differently. And just because they would tell it one way doesn't make it better than mine or, or mine better than theirs. It's just different. And it will appeal to different people because we are all different in our hearts, in what we find uh, interesting and what we enjoy listening to. That's the beautiful thing about music, right? Find me a human who doesn't love it. You won't. We all love different kinds of music, sure, but find me a human that doesn't like music. You won't. So, and that's the beauty of it is there's all different kinds. Very true. Very true. You know, I've always known you to be, you know, a wonderful role model and uh, a great advice giver. So what would you say is some of the best advice you've received that could be applied to the creative industry? Oh my gosh. Uh, you know your stories better than anyone else. No one lives inside your world. 
I mean, you, you'll you have friends and you'll have family who you'll share your world with, but no one lives inside your heart. And the story that's yours dies with you if you don't share it. Put it out there. You don't know who you will inspire. You don't know who you will challenge. You don't know who will grow for having come across your path. Um, and that's true of all of us. We grow from one another. And so tell that story. Don't be afraid to tell that story. And and something that I'm I'm learning as I get older is that self-doubt and fear are incredibly crippling, but they're incredibly limiting. And in the end, you are the one that gets to make the decision. You are the one that gets to decide, look, am I going to hide behind fear and not do what I want to do? Or am I going to stand up and put that aside? And sure, you're still going to feel it. Of course, you're still going to feel it. Your choice is whether or not you allow yourself to be crippled by it. And so I would say swallow, swallow really hard and take that deep breath and just put that foot in front of the other. Just step out with that right foot. And you know what? If somebody steps on that foot, somebody steps on that foot, but at least you tried. Because again, two o'clock in the morning is a very lonely place when you are the one that stands in your own way. You've got no one else to blame but yourself. What would you say to someone who wants to go into a creative field but is feeling similar things that you did? Like, let's say they're a college graduate or a high school graduate and, and they want to go into the arts. What, what would you say to them? I know this might sound a little overused because I've said it so many times tonight, but to believe in yourself, to know that there's something unique in you that the rest of the world does not have. And, you know, you may turn on the radio and hear a million other mezzo-sopranos singing their songs or, you know, go to a Broadway audition and there's a million other ladies there that are auditioning. And that's fine. And it may give the appearance that everyone is the same, but we are not. And you are a part of that difference. There is something special that you have inside you that we haven't seen yet. And we grow and and we are better and stronger for you. Anyone who loves art in any fashion or any medium walks away from it stronger in some fashion. Either they're touched, um, they're influenced, they're inspired, they're motivated perhaps, but your failure for whatever reason to share that light with the world is more harmful than you think. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You you deny someone the opportunity to grow because of you. I saw a, a quote in a writer's thing on, on Instagram a little while ago that reminds me of that. It says that there's somebody out there just waiting for the book that you're in the middle of writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm definitely, you know, in the same camp in terms of like going for your dreams and at least trying. But of course, there's so many things that stand in people's way, whether it's logistics, economics, do you feel that someone should still try for their dreams, even if it means they're going to have to work like 10 jobs or something like that? Do you like, like, where, what's the breaking point, do you think? I, I don't, I don't know, because I'm so new to the beginning of this journey. Maybe ask me that in a year or five years, maybe. Um, I, I just know that you owe it to yourself. If there's a story in your heart, be it a song, be it a painting, if there's a story in your heart, you owe it to yourself. Um, I, 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 gosh, Tammy, I'm sorry. I, I wish I knew the answer to that. I wish I had an inspired word um, for that. I will say that maybe your full cognition and understanding of the barriers and limitations that you have, be, be honest with yourself about what those are. If they're not as limiting as you think they are, then they're not as, you know what I mean? They, they don't, for example, let's take me for example. I don't play an instrument, right? So that's very severely handicapping to someone who is looking to be a performance artist. So it, that's not stopping me. I'm looking for other people who play. I've met other people who play. So I'm working with someone here in Kansas um, who is a multi-instrumentalist. Um, you know, if, if it's something that you can do that's within your reach, do it. And even if it's not within your reach, still try. Because again, you're accountable to yourself at two in the morning. Um, if you've done everything that you can and you've tried everything that you can, then you can say with an honest heart, I did the best that I could. And then still practice your art. 
just because other people don't see it or hear it or experience it doesn't make your performance of it less real. It's still real to you. It still affects your heart and it still makes you feel good. You know, it didn't matter if five people saw those TikTok videos or 300 people. I felt really good because I did it. It was a fear that I conquered. It was something that I loved doing and I had a great time with it. So regardless of if everybody hated it or not, it didn't matter. I did it and I enjoyed it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What is a common myth about the arts or stereotype rather that you hope to break? That it's not inclusive of everyone, that there isn't a place for everyone. There is a place for all of us. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter the resources or the home that you come from. Every person is gifted with a story. Every person is gifted with a talent of some sort. And there is a place for you, even if you think there isn't. And if you try and it doesn't work, that's okay because you gave yourself a chance and you gave the world the chance to see who you were. Yeah, that for me, that was the greatest misconception. And I will tell you, we went to New York City to a show um, on Broadway in 2017 and we stood at stage door. And, you know, the cast comes out and they say hi and you get to take pictures. And I remember standing there in that moment thinking, you know, wow, I wish I had tried. I mean, would I be on Broadway? Who knows? Probably not. You know, but, but, you know, that I denied myself that chance. And there is a place for everyone there. When my daughter was in high school, her uh, performance teacher, she was very involved in theater and performing arts. um, Her performance teacher and I were, were speaking and I told him this story. And he said, Jennifer, that's just, that's just sad. He said, that's just sad because there is a place for you. There's a place for everyone. And and hearing him say that made me think for the first time, wait a minute, there is a place. Yeah, it's I think sometimes the hardest things for people in the creative field to work through is really, you know, being our own worst critic, so to speak. Yes. And and there's beauty and imperfection. At the beginning, when I was doing those TikTok singing videos, oh my gosh, I'd record them, you know, 20, 30, 40 times because I would be flat on one note or I'd miss a pitch here, you know, something like that. I started posting the videos that had imperfections in them because it's true. None of us are perfect. I mean, think about in the social media world, how many times do you take a picture with your friends or of yourself, a selfie before you post one, you know, 80 times? That's ridiculous. You know, we work so hard to put on a perfect face and what that does is it makes makes the rest of the world feel like it's not okay if you're not perfect. And that's not true. People, people like me and people like me, when we see that, we think there's no place. It just solidifies the fact that there is no place for other people. And that's just not true. Your difference is what makes you beautiful and your difference is what makes you unique. You know, I've, I've seen recently in the last year or two, and I don't know if it's sort of come out because of the pandemic, but, you know, people doing things like a no makeup photo or, you know, like being more comfortable with showing their curvy bodies, things of that nature. And I think it's fantastic that people are being comfortable being themselves, like you said, and not taking 80 million pictures, you know, and just being more authentic, really getting down to that. Absolutely. It inspires other people. It inspires other people. It, they, they see, oh, well, this person looks different. They're doing it. I could do it too. And again, it's, it's twofold. It's actually taking that step and doing it and then being aware of the fact that you may face ugly. There may be unkind people that respond to you, but the decision is yours as to whether or not you receive that. And, and that's something that, going back to, to a question that you asked earlier about a piece of advice that I would give, this is a piece of advice that I would give to anyone that was young, regardless of whether or not they were a performer. You are not responsible for what people say to you and how people respond to you and how people interact with you. That's 600% on them. But the beautiful thing is you are the one that gets to choose how you receive it. And that is not a lesson that I was taught. And I wish I had been. And that's a lesson that we taught our daughter um, and that I was very close to a lot of her friends growing up, still am, um, and taught them as well. You get to choose. If someone says the ugly word to you, are you going to believe them? Are you going to give them that power or not? We're a lot more powerful than we give ourselves credit for being. You know, I I know you said you want to go into the music field, but if you ever change your mind, I feel like you could be a fantastic motivational speaker and a life coach. Wow. Thank you very much. Wow. That that makes me feel really good. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Or maybe even hosting your own podcast, you know? Oh, maybe. Maybe if 
maybe if you know someone who might like a co-host or wants to take a vacation and, and need somebody to fill in while she's gone, you can give her my number. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so we're going to switch gears a little bit. If you If you could have no limitations or budgets on a project, unlimited funds, but you could only pick one project, uh, what do you think you would do? Wow. The first thing that came to my mind would be like a collaborative effort. Like think, you know, USA for Africa from like the 80s. I don't know if you if you are familiar, certainly you're familiar with We Are the World and, and that sort of thing. Some kind of collaborative effort where we brought together powerhouse people with all different kinds of talent. Di- you know, not just a pop singer or not just a country singer, you know, a, a collaborative effort where the good goes to other people. I mean, not not only is music produced that, that's beautiful and inspiring that makes people feel good, but funds are raised and attention is called and, you know, good comes from it that affects other people. I just, what a wonderful thing to do. What a wonderful thing to do. And I was a kid in the 80s, so I loved seeing, you know, all the, the Michael Jacksons and the Lionel Richies, you know, I, I loved that, um, you know, seeing that as a girl. So something like that, I think would be wonderful to unite people or maybe to set up a music education program. Um, to help younger people learn about music and learn not just, you know, singing or playing, but theory and appreciation and, you know, all everything that you need to know to be a good, a good, a good steward of music, a good participant in it, a good purveyor of it, all of it. Now, I, I know you said you wanted to go to music school and that's fantastic. I absolutely love all of my music school um, experiences, but do you feel that... Music is also something that someone can learn without an education. I think so. I think so. I think for me, the the wanting to go to school to study it was to to be in the space that I denied myself the opportunity to be in. No one else denied me that. That was me. Um, I think that's why I want to do it. But absolutely. I mean, think about all of the people in the world who are popular, who were popular entertainers that didn't study it. Um, Rachel Bay Jones is a Broadway singer. She's also an actor. She's on several television shows right now. And I call her my Broadway crush. I just love her. Um, she's one of the talent that we saw when we were in New York City, and I'm just crazy about her. And her her story is she was from Hawaii and her grandmother sold her wedding ring to give her the money to go to New York City. I don't even think she finished high school. She may have, but she certainly didn't study it in college. And in one year's time, amassed a Tony, a Grammy, and an Emmy for being involved with that show. Um, you know, obviously, Emmy, would she performed for, on television, um, and then the Broadway album got the Tony, and then she got a Tony for, I'm, I'm sorry, got the Grammy, and then she got the Tony for being on stage. So it's just proof positive that no, you don't have to have an academic background in it. You just have the pa- have to have the passion and the talent, and she does. <laughs> she really does. You know, sometimes people in the creative fields experience burnout or need to just take a huge break. You know, what sort of advice would you give to someone who who needs to find their spark again? That's hard for me to answer because I've not been to that point. You know, I've I've never been a performing musician or a, a prolific musician such that I'd come to a point where I was burned out. But I think I would say to them, remember why you started. And and if you have it in your library, if you have memories of a conversation with someone or an email from someone or a comment on your post or, you know, something where another person conveyed to you how meaningful your art was to them, remember that. And remember that for every person that comments or walks up to you at stage door, there's probably 20 who think it, but either don't have the courage or the opportunity to share that with you. So remember why you started. Remember why it was meaningful to you and do it for that reason. Don't do it for the fame. Don't do it for the money. Don't do it for the likes. Do it because it's what makes you happy. And it's because it's what lights you up from within. And if it's authentic and it's real, it will appeal to someone who we don't know. How many people we don't know, but it will appeal because it's authentic. There is so much music today that is, you know, auto-tuned and and not authentic and overly, you know, harmonized and all of that, you know, just be authentic and the people will come. And even if they don't, you will know at the end of the day that you did the right thing. You followed your heart. You know, God gave you a talent and you used it. You spoke about how you were in community theater and you're getting back into music. 
Um, would you mind telling me about a time when you felt most alive and most happy about that? Oh, my gosh. Um, so I told you the story about how my daughter said, you know, I, I wish she would be back on stage. That was maybe a year after she was in fifth grade and it was actually Oscar night. And she walked into our bedroom and she said, Mom, I am going to win an Oscar and I am going to Juilliard. My husband and I were like, how do you know what Juilliard is? You know, like, <laughs> what, what, is, what is that? You know, so that's when she got involved in community theater. And then when she threw that gauntlet down at me, I kind of felt like I have no choice, right? I have to get up there. And, and audition. And so I did. We did uh, Tom Sawyer uh, as a play. And I was uh, the aunt. And they gave me creative license to be funny and loud and, you know, take up lots of space and use my body for physical comedy. And so physical comedy is funny anyway, but when it's an overweight person doing it, it's even funnier. Um, and I was loud and people laughed and I had to learn the art of waiting to say your next line until they stop laughing, you know? So that, that was a good problem to have. And um, after the show, we would walk off stage and then go to the back and people would come up and, you know, family would come up and hug you and take pictures or people would approach you and say, oh, that was great. I had lines of people waiting to talk to me. You know, Aww. you were so funny and, you know, you made us laugh so hard. And, and that just made me feel really good because I knew that that was time well spent for them you know, that it, that it made them laugh and it brought them joy. So, you know, early morning, Saturday rehearsals, late night, Tuesday night rehearsals when I had to be at work early the next day, that's all worth it when someone says that, that you touch them in, in a good way, you know, you made them laugh or made them feel. So that felt really, really good. That's fantastic. It was a lot of fun. I miss it. Our theater company went dark um, in the pandemic, of course, as most theater companies did, uh, but just never recovered. So unfortunately, our our company has closed. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. When, when I was involved, we had a lot of good times. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Community theater is holds a special place in many people's hearts. And I think it's fantastic when, when it, it can, you know, when it's able to be in a community. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to do a few fun, quirky questions. Okay. And sometimes they're actually harder than the serious questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, one of them is if you had intro music or a theme song for your life, what would it be? Like a lot of people, I watched American Idol in its earlier days now, not so much, but I remember Jordan Sparks many years ago did I Who Have Nothing, that big, you know, I Who Have Nothing song. And she had the, you know, the bomb, bomb, bomb drums, you know, and the big orchestra behind it. So I love the thought of, you know, walking in a room to that kind of music, you know, like, ta-da, Jennifer's here. You know, I, I love that. But that and but that's not really my personality. I mean, I'm more, you know, kind and and loving and and my relationships matter to me. So, I don't know, maybe some nice piano music or something. I don't know. Nice. Just something cheery and optimistic that makes you feel good. I don't know. <laughs> not one particular song or anything. Okay, so if you were stranded on a desert island, you can only bring one music album, one book, one beverage and one food. What would that be? Okay, well, as you know, because you follow me on social media, I'm a coffee person. I love going to coffee houses. So I would take an iced coffee, um, but it has to have caramel in it. I'm not really a vanilla person. It's got to have caramel in it. Um, and it's got to be decaf and it's got to have fat-free milk and no whipped cream. So there's there's my specific uh, Starbucks order. My dad was a big music lover too, and he loved Fleetwood Mac when I grew up. And so of course I love them because I, I grew up listening to them. I think uh, Christine McVie is incredible, but Stevie Nicks is just, oh my gosh, is she amazing. Um, so they did an album called The Dance, which is a live album. Um, and then the concert was on television. And so I would take that album because it's incredible. Um, they do two songs at the very end with the USC marching band, which is just incredible to have these young musicians playing that kind of instrument in that kind of song. So it's just incredible and it gives me chills when I hear it. Um, what food would I take? I, I'm going to say an overall food, which would be cheese, because that's, I love cheese on everything, you know, pizza, and, you know, you name it, cheese. Um, and what book? Mrs. Kennedy and Me 
uh, by Clint Hill. So Clint Hill was the Secret Service agent. If you go back and look at the the film from the day that John F. Kennedy was shot, you'll see Jackie Kennedy crawling out, and he crawls on top of her. He was her Secret Service agent, um, and he wrote this beautiful book called Mrs. Kennedy and Me, and it's basically a love story. Um, they weren't, of course, romantically involved. There was nothing inappropriate going on, but they were so incredibly fond of one another. And it's just this incredible friendship that transcends, you know, life experience and horrible tragedy. Obviously, the death of her husband, the death of her child, um, just a beautiful love story. And he's an incredible writer. So, uh, yeah, Mrs. Kennedy and me. Excellent. I, I have not heard of that book. I'll have to add that to my reading list. Yeah, let me know what you think of it. It's wonderful. Will do. So another quirky question is, what is your favorite movie and what does it reveal about you? I think I've got two and they have a very similar theme underneath it. Um, Steel Magnolias. And obviously because of the FIMU element um, in that movie, uh, you and I are both FIMUs. Um, Susan Harling uh, is the woman who Shelby was based on the character of Shelby. Robert Harling, her brother, wrote the book. So Steel Magnolia is in a league of their own. And what those two movies have in common is the relationships between these women, you know, that, that pass through time, that pass through tragedy, that pass through good and bad. My relationships, the people in my life, especially my, my women friends, the women in my life, mean the world to me. And so I, I see myself in, the, in those movies. Plus, in high school, I was in Steel Magnolias in the play. Um, I got to play Clary, and one of my best friends was Weezer, and it was so much fun. So whenever we see that stuff come up on Facebook, we're like, oh, look, it's us. You know, we got to, you know, smack each other around and, and be obnoxious and have so much fun. <laughs> but I, I would say Steel Magnolias in a league of their own just because of the, the relationship and the incredible storytelling. You laugh, you cry, you feel the whole gamut of emotion when you watch those movies. Excellent. Yeah, they are really, really good. What is a favorite TV show and what does it reveal about you? You know, I'm, I kind of stopped watching TV in the pandemic, I will say, but there are so many that I, oh my gosh, that I love. You know, most women my age would say Sex in the City, which is true, although the reboot, not so good earlier this year, not so good. My daughter turned me on to Jane the Virgin, which was just hilarious and full of heart. I don't know if you saw it, but it was absolutely hilarious and, and full of heart. Yeah, maybe, I'd, maybe I would say Jane the Virgin because it was so quirky and silly, but underneath it was this large, very beating heart. These people were incredible people and they really loved each other and they were good people. Um, maybe the newsroom, um, because Aaron Sorkin is a complete genius. Everything he writes is completely genius. Uh, there were two people that I work with who watched that show as well. So we would always huddle the next day and talk about it and um, just inspired incredible writing. Uh, sometimes I'd have to watch an episode twice because it was pretty, you know, fast paced and, and pretty. Some of the lingo was pretty deep, but it was a great show. So yeah, I would say those two. But there are many, many more. The Golden Girls, for obvious reasons, because, you know, you laugh. And, and I, was, I was young in that time. And, the, and certainly we didn't focus on, television didn't focus on older women, certainly not their sexuality or, you know, their relationships or anything like that. And it was just so beautifully done and so funny. Um, and how sad that we lost Betty, you know, right? Mm -hmm. The day before she turned 100. Oh. So to me, she was 100. At that point, she was 100. <laughs> yeah. What an icon. What an icon. Yeah. What a gift she was to us. You know, how lucky, how lucky we were to have had her. And, and I feel like circling back to what you were talking about, you know, everyone finding their own light and, and forging their own path. Betty White definitely did that too. Yeah, absolutely. And to go back and see, I mean, the word that came to mind was dishy. She was just stunningly gorgeous. And still, I mean, still was until she died, you know, and that beautiful singing voice and to just be able to use humor like that and make people laugh. What a gift. What a gift that you give the world when you make them laugh. Life is hard. It's hard to be a person and to get 30 minutes once a week to be able to laugh, and which of course, now you can stream it. So you don't have to wait another week for the show like we did in the 80s you can stream it all right away but yeah what a gift she gave us and we were very very fortunate to have had her and I remember the day she died I remember I was driving and I got the alert on my phone and I pulled over and I just said make the angels laugh make the angels laugh and that's sometimes I I think about her and my dad up there making the angels laugh <laughs>
So I'm going to kick back to a more serious question. Um, I, I try to ask this of every guest if I am able to fit it in, but what does living a creative life mean to you? Oh, wow. What a great question. Living a creative life means that your stories are told, means that you aren't the owner of your stories. Your stories get told and shared with the world in whatever fashion you choose to do it. You know, if it's music, if it's painting, if it's sculpture, in whatever fashion that you choose to do it. And the world is better for your presence, for your activity, for your involvement, even if it's just one person, even if it's just that one person who is touched by that, that's living a creative life. That's, that's using a talent or a skill or a gift that you've been given, be it what it is. It could be cooking, you know, it certainly wouldn't have to be anything artistic, you know, anything that you love doing that's a passion of yours that you put into the world and maybe the hopes that it'll touch someone else. That's living a creative life. Love that. Before we go, is there any other thoughts you would like to leave with the listeners? Oh my gosh believe in yourself. There is a place in this world for you and you don't know who you will inspire. There's, I have a a very close girlfriend um, who I just dearly love and I watch her move through life. She is one of these women that intentionally hypes other women up, loves other women, stands behind other women. You know, her happiness is defined by the strength that she helps other people to feel for themselves. And so I'm just in awe of her and I have been the beneficiary of that love. And, you know, hey, you, you look beautiful or you're doing great. You know, I've been the beneficiary of that. And twice now, she has once many years ago and then once very recently, she's gone behind my back and said to my daughter, hey, what's your mailing address? I, I need your mailing address. And she's written like poems for me or beautiful Aww. cards to me about how she sees my place in the world and how, um, you know, I, I make other people feel good. And I'm like, coming from you, really? You're saying, you are saying that about me? You know, so that that just made me feel really, really good. And so I guess I would just say, be yourself, be authentically yourself and let the world see you. You don't know. And, and that's when I got those cards from her. I did the, well, the first one, definitely. I was like, I had no idea you felt that way about me. You know, sure. You thought I was nice. Sure. You thought I was a good person. That's lovely. Isn't that nice? But I didn't know that she saw me through those eyes. And I think especially, and maybe everyone is like this, but especially people who don't always feel good about themselves don't think other people see them in a favorable light either. And you have no idea. You have no idea how someone feels. And I know that sounds really cliche, but the kind word that you share or the, or the, the goodness or the, the, the kindness that you put forth to them could make all of the difference in the world to them. Um, so just be yourself and be a good person. A phrase that, that I love to say is that kindness is the rent that we pay to live here. And it really, really is. It really, really is. Um, the, it just, it can't be understated, the good that you do. And it comes back to you. And even if it doesn't come back to you, then you still did the right thing. Someone stands taller because of you. And that's something that no one can ever take from you. The good that you do is something that can't ever be taken away. I love that. Really excellent thoughts and such wonderful, deep conversation. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, (laughs) Listeners, please check out the show notes for Jennifer Smith's biography and her social media handles so that you can connect with her and share on her journey. And if you love Chats with Musicians, make sure to tune in to the 60 plus episodes featuring musicians, artists, actors, and more. As always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for Creative Piecemeal Podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.